Um, I just want to move along. So our next presenter is Dr. Shahari. As most of you know, Dr. Shahari is a professor at the University of Buffalo. And today's talk is going to be on Cedar Fox and iFox. And uh, Dr. Shahari, if you'll come on up, we'll get started. Okay, a little bit of background. This talk is not going to be a, a real uh, detailed computer science type of talk. Okay, I uh, started as a computer scientist more than 40 years ago. I entered the field of artificial intelligence. And there was a hubris at that time that, you know, everything uh, human beings do can all be automated, uh, that uh, computers are going to replace human beings. This was 40 years ago. And I've been working in that field, uh, AI. And then um, uh, I, the way I got into forensics was we, uh, we, we got a major project from the U.S. Postal Service to develop a system for reading handwritten postal addresses. And at that time, uh, people uh, felt that, you know, I can't read my own handwriting. How can I get a computer to read handwriting, you know? So anyway, we worked, we worked on that system, and many, many people contributed to those projects all over. But we did the first system for that. And today... Uh, ab about 96 or 97 percent of all handwritten mail in the postal stream is uh, read by machines. We allowed the postal service to continue to be in existence for a few more years than than it looks like it's going to be uh, in terms of the economics. Uh, so, so that's that's what we did. And I came into this field because I was approached uh, when Daubert uh, ruling came out, saying, you, you know, you seem to know something about computer processing of handwriting. Maybe you can help this uh, community by seeing uh, how you can develop some automated systems for. Uh, uh, for, uh, you know, question document examination, and said, oh, what a nice uh, challenge. So let me see if I can bring some of those techniques into this domain and see what we can do. And I was sure that we're going to do it all completely automatically. And um, so that's how we developed our early work, published in 2002 in the Journal of Forensic Sciences. We put together a system. We had all the tools in place. We had developed all these feature extraction algorithms for postal automation. We said, let's just plug all those feature extractors into it, they were all very abstract feature extractors, all kinds of features that no human being could understand what those features were. We plugged them all in, and then we had all these. We created this database that was uh, referred to earlier on today. And uh, we did, what, 96 97% accuracy on those full pages of handwriting and so on. So it looked pretty good. Well, since then, uh, I've had to take a hard look. Uh, Sachs criticized what I had to say, and a lot of his criticisms were good, actually. Saying, okay, you had a full page of text, you got uh, diverse populations and all this type of stuff. So uh, maybe I should be looking at you know, smaller amounts of writing and, and, and more similar writing and so on. And I concluded, yeah, you know, we really should, uh, we need to have uh, better methods to be able to handle smaller amounts of writing. And also, we all col we collected statistics of handwriting from, from a certain database. Will that really work with, with different populations? Those have to be learned too, and so on. So uh, taking a hard look at all of this, I've now con concluded after, after some 30-plus uh, years in this field to see what is really the role of automation in, uh, in the examination of handwritten items, lessons learned, and what could be done in the future. So my uh, discussion today, I will begin by talking about what uh, has been referred to as computational thinking. Computer science definitely has a role to play in almost what everything human beings do, one of which is think computationally about whatever may be the task at hand and what is computational thinking. I'll talk about that, about that briefly. And how computational thinking can come into question document examination, which can be thought of as reverse engineering, saying, okay, this is how human beings do this. How could we reverse engineering into this computer? And then I'll talk a little bit about the kinds of tools that could be used. The main bottom line is that I'm concluding that really we can't be you know, saying that we can automate everything today of what question document examiners do. Or in all of the forensic disciplines, I've had a chance to look at some of the other ones like footwear and, and latent prints and so on. All of these disciplines uh, have the same kind of issues. And I've concluded that, no, we are not ready for fully automating everything. We really should have tools that are going to be working with human beings. We can help them do their jobs better, but we're not going to be replacing them. And so what are those tools, and how does, how does all this fit? And the big picture is, what is the computational thinking? So I'm going to kind of go through a little bit of this in the time that I have. All right, so the big issue, computational thinking. This was made uh, famous by, by an early uh, artificial intelligence researcher called Seymour Papert, who worked with Marvin Minsky at, at MIT, and then more recently by Jeanette Wing, uh, who she was at Carnegie Mellon. 
uh, about this concept, computational thinking. It is a way to solve problems, design systems, and understand human behavior. Drawing on concepts of computer science. We talk about some fundamental concepts we teach in a, you know, computer science 101 as to, you know, what, is, what does it take to write a computer program. So this is the kind of thinking that we do in computer science can be applied to, uh, to a broader context of things that we do, like, like cooking a dish, right? What is the sequence of steps we go through in cooking a dish? Um, or what is the sequence of steps we go through in examining a handwritten item? So these are all things, can we kind of apply computational thinking to it? And my picture on the right, which you probably can't see at all, maybe you can see it on the, on the printout, it's about uh, how uh, to cook. Uh, this, uh, this whole thing is a you know, uh, chicken dinner for guests. And there are three parts to it. Clean the house, cook, set the table, all right? And eat, drink, and be merry. Those are the three, four big circles. And uh, clean the house has two parts, vacuum dining room and tidy up living room. Those are the two parts to it. And uh, cooking involves three parts. Do vegetables, shop for ingredients, uh, roast chicken, and choose recipe. Okay, those are the... And then there are sub-parts to it. Shop for ingredients has uh, make shopping list and drive to the store. And then uh, set table is find tablecloth, put out silverware, put out glassware, get plates out, napkins. All right, that's, that's part of it. And then we got the final part. So this is kind of abstraction saying there are major parts to it. And there are subparts to it and so on. Of course, that's how we think about things. So this is simply saying that there is some kind of abstraction going on. One really doesn't need to mix up uh, setting the, like, you know, finding the tablecloth with vacuuming the dining room, things like that. There's not necessarily some interaction that goes on there. So that's called data hiding and so on. So this is the kind of thing that could be applied to anything human beings do, including forensics. So what are the major concepts of computational thinking? One is abstraction, which we just talked about. Abstraction is to understand and solve problems more effectively. Think about all the what are the major problems, sub-problems, things like that. And the second part is of computational thinking is algorithmic thinking and mathematics. So to develop efficient, fair, and secure solutions. Algorithmic thinking is simply to be able to express your thoughts, saying these are the sequence of steps. I'm going to get into this loop, keep doing it until a certain condition is satisfied, a drop out of it when that happens. And of course, in making some of these things, we may want to bring in some mathematics in terms of uh, what are the variables and how do they add up and things like that. And another aspect of computational thinking is understanding scale. That is, how does this scale up? What is efficiency? There are economic and social reasons for understanding scale. Uh, cooking for, uh, for four people invited uh, to your house for a dinner, will that scale up to uh, having 100 people over? for dinner. So that's, that's a scaling thing, and does it computationally scale up? Maybe the combinatorial possibilities become so hard. In computer science, it becomes very hard very quickly, as I'll show in the case of handwriting. Even with a few variables, you're going you're gonna to face enormous computational issues here, so scaling becomes an issue. Okay, so that's about computational thinking. Now, again, this issue of uh, relationship of computational thinking and law. This has also been looked at. A long dream of all of law has been logical rules to automate verdict. This has started from 1804, Napoleonic Code, it's called. There's a manuscript shown at the right side here. To minimize discretion, maximize predictability of outcome. These are the kinds of goals for the Napoleonic Code in law. But it floundered because of uh, vagueness of words and variations of the real world. All right? So... People have made attempts in the early days of artificial intelligence, expert systems to replacements of the judiciary. Why do we need all this judiciary? Let's just have expert systems to do all of this. Well, they've had a poor record of uh, both success and, and uptake. All right. On the other hand, better in inroads have been made by legal reasoning systems, which merely assist in making legal decisions. Example, construct hypotheses for evidence in a crime scene. So these are the possibilities that are presented to you. And remind the detective of hypothesis that they might have missed. So this is the kind of thing that they have made better inroads for, to have such legal systems. So this has been referred to as mind expanding, that is, you look at more possibilities, that expands your mind, avoids the pitfalls of mind narrowing, saying, why do we need a human here? Let's just simply do it all by computer. So mind uh, expanding is, is a better uh, thing to do with computers rather than mind narrowing. All right. So let's now, uh, I've, I've, talk, I've talked about computational thinking, I've talked about uh, computational thinking and law, and let's get into computer, computational thinking and forensics. So computational thinking is useful in domains where human judgment is involved. Human judgment is involved in terms of, you know, what are the attributes, what are the features here, right? And I've found over the years that the biggest uh, drawback of these automated systems for handwriting is getting those features right. 
Okay, we developed a postal system that did pretty well doing those features, but when I look at the fine variations, those features are not good enough. They do a reasonable job on large pages and things like that, but when we are looking at fine handwriting, those features were not good enough. Our human eye discriminates these things much better. You know, our uh, retina and, and, the, and the neuro system that, that we have evolved over these, uh, you know, millions of years are very good in terms of picking out these fine variations. And uh, we've also thought, well, maybe our initial features for a postal system were too rough, and then let's, let's think, like, what are the features you, you, you give if you ask a document examiner? We have made those attempts. They're not still, still good enough. So there is human judgment that's coming into play. So that human judgment is involved here. And then also for computational thinking, uh, we, need, uh, we need to do some knowledge engineering in the sense we need to sit down and ask the document examiner, uh, what, how do you do this? So it's a, it's, it's a create starting point for creating artificial intelligence. An expert system involves interviewing a doctor saying, what do you do? What are the things you do? And then you try and automate this stuff. And sometimes it's hard to uh, get that knowledge engineering done right. But fortunately in forensics, uh, a lot of these have been already uh, stated. Okay, what are the sequence of steps that we do? All your ASTM documents have uh, had many of the experts sit together and, uh, and say, well, these are the things we do. And so that is a good starting point, particularly with impression evidence, handwriting, latent prints, footwear marks, and so on. Much of the long, uh, knowledge engineering has been done, uh, done. And in handwriting, of course, the success has been demonstrated in recognition. So it seems like... Uh, it's a nice meeting point for computational thinking and forensics. So let's talk about the knowledge engineering for forensic document examination. I've got a couple of pictures here. These are the ASTM standards that were spoken of uh, uh, this morning. Standard guide for examination of handwritten items and the standard uh, terminology for expressing conclusions of forensic document examiners. I was very happy to hear that this is all going to be in the public domain very, very soon, the end of this month or something like that. This has all been hidden from computer scientists because they're all copyrighted documents. So now we have a lot of this knowledge engineering available. We can say we can look at it. Much of the knowledge engineering is available in these documents. It says what are the sequence of steps. We can now say well, how can we have a computer program kind of follow these kinds of steps. There are many textbooks uh, on, on uh, handwriting examination. For example, uh, there is something called the CAT principle. Are the documents comparable? Uh, is the amount of handwriting you have adequate? Uh, is the handwriting time contemporaneous? Things like these. These are all uh, things that have been expressed clearly. What are the characteristics of handwriting? What are class characteristics? What are individualizing characteristics? And we use, the document examiners say that we use seven S's. Size, slant, spacing, shading, system, speed, and strokes. Right? Some of these kinds of things have been expressed clearly. So the knowledge engineering has been done. A computer scientist doesn't have to go and sit down and interview document examiners because these are, these are clearly expressed on many, many documents that are available. And then one of these, the ASTM documents, I was just looking at it, where is the algorithm here? So you look at the, uh, uh, the ASTM document, it says these are the kinds of steps to do. Determine whether it's a Q versus Q, K versus K, or a Q versus K. And for Q and K, you ask the question, uh, are these uh, good quality? Are they copies? Are they distorted or disguised? What is the type and range? What are the individualizing characteristics? These are the kinds of questions to ask. So we can now, uh, computer scientists can go back and say, how can I help in these things? Uh, are they comparable? Are these uh, two documents comparable? If not, uh, uh, if not uh, uh, you know, ask for new uh, and, and repeat. And then differences and similarities for conclusion. Uh, right here is just a word cloud. I, I took the ASTM procedure and fed it to a word cloud program. came out like this, saying these are the words that are most important. So in a sense, getting what are the important things that are, that are here. And uh, here is a pseudo code for actually taking that. I wrote it as a, uh, as a computer program now. This is what a document examiner does. And the same, same idea has been written in the form of uh, what we call a pseudo code. I call this as an interactive forensic examination system, or IFOX, in the sense uh, there are, this is the overall procedure, and there are sub steps that we can, we can, we can contribute. Uh, uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, the tools uh, uh, involved, uh, like in individualizing characteristics, comparability, comparison, and adequacy. And uh, how do we get hold of individualizing characteristics? Here are some examples of the common, most commonly encountered TH. And so what we decided, what I, I feel at this point is a human examiner should provide those features, saying, uh, you say that these are the features I'm using. Then we can help by saying, well, uh, the features are given in this table. There are six, uh, six characteristics of TH that actually comes from a paper of Muehlberger. 
Uh, he said, for each of those features, these are the possible values. We simply take it from a human being. You tell us what those features are. Then, then we get into computational mode, and then we calculate, for example, the TH on the left side is a high probability. It is uh, 3 in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in 900, whereas uh, the second one is, uh, is 7 in uh, 100 uh, million. All right, so that is, uh, so we can assign numbers now to these things, just like the DNA people do, that when you have this feature, how, how rare is that, is that? And so we could calculate these kinds of things by looking at samples of handwriting. And so the problem here is computational, actually. If you have six variables, uh, with each of them taking four or five values, the number of probabilities you need is about 4,800. This is a combinatorial problem I spoke about. If you have for the word A and D, the number of possible uh, probabilities can be as high as a million. Million different probabilities, let alone you know, how much data you need, right? So, uh, and also we cannot assume independence, right? If you assume two variables are independent, you can get nonsensical results. This is a very simple table I constructed about two variables uh, about human beings, height and weight. They are not independent variables. They are dependent variables. If you assume they are independent and you multiply probabilities, you will get a ridiculous statement that short and light is six times more probable than tall and light. Okay. All right. So uh, if you are, you know, being short and light is uh, is uh, very uh, much more likely than being tall and light. You know? And the other one is if tall and light twice the probability of short and so that's the correct one actually. This is the correct statement. All right. Short and light is six times more probable. Tall and light is twice probability of short and light. It's wrong. So this is an independence assumption. Right? So this is a correct correct statement. This is a wrong statement. So you, you get totally counterintuitive things if you assume independence. Should not assume independence. All right. So how do we do this thing? If you are, if you do not assume independence, you are, you, are, you are facing a big computational problem. So for that, we are implementing a machine learning technique called probabilistic graphical models that take into account correlation between variables. Even if you have six variables, the number of possible combinations becomes very large. But by using some techniques like this, we, uh, we can... So we have to learn these things. For this, uh, we are implementing what are called Bayesian networks and learning algorithms. <laughs> Very interesting that in such a small problem becomes a big com computer science problem There's a, in a class of problems called NP-hard. So there are, uh, okay, uh, the chair tells me I have no more time <laughs> left. So there is a type determination uh, is something that, that, again, a probabilistic analysis can do that. Opinion scales, likelihood ratios, and so on can be computed, uh, then mapped into opinion scales from likelihood ratios. So I won't say anything more about that. Adequacy is a very interesting issue. One of the important things for a document examiner is do you have adequate amount of handwriting sample here? How do you handle that? Quantitatively, there is a way of doing it. These are called as uh, confidence intervals. As you get more and more samples, your confidence intervals become tighter and tighter and tighter. So statistically, we can help the document examiner figure out, do you have adequate data here, right? Otherwise, there is no simple way of saying, is there adequacy, all right? So some of these things are all, uh, are all uh, available for, as automation tools, uh, interactive tools rather than automations. Again, the main, main message I'm saying is all of these have to be interactive rather than saying we're going to replace uh, the document examiner uh, it doesn't li look likely in the, in, the, in the near future, all right? Uh, so incorporate computational thinking and uh, make it mind-expanding. Probability allows considering characteristics otherwise ignored. So all of the things I said in the beginning are really applicable to handwriting, all right? So the work in progress are um, characteristics. Look, how, uh, how, how, what characteristics do document examiners use? So what we're doing is uh, interviewing document examiners to create or let them create the set of features they will use. And then we bring that in, and then we help uh, learn the probabilities for all of these, depending on dip different data sets. What we have to do now is create different learning tools, because you might one day be working with population from the 1980s or, or, or 20 years ago. Today's handwriting may be quite different from the Palmer style that was learned. Today we are doing Zener Blosser, right, in the schools. <laughs> and maybe not even that. So the statistics and all that might change. So all the stuff that was done with old data may be totally irrele irrelevant in today's world. And we have to relearn all this stuff. And that can be done if you have proper machine learning automation tools that will take samples and create new data sets, create new probabilities. All right. So in summary, the message I have is that uh, computational thinking plus forensics, I uh, call it, Katrina and I, we call it as computational forensics, all right, uh, to be solved using abstraction, 
algorithms, mathematics. Mathematics is important to do the, all those probability type of calculations and, of course, scalability of these solutions. Okay? I'm out of time, so I'll stop here. Do we have any questions from the floor? No online questions, so it's all up to you guys. Not one question. Hey. I'll ask a question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in the introduction, I said the talk was about Cedar Fox and iFox. Uh, what is iFox? I know Cedar Fox. <laughs> that is just a concept. iFox is interactive oh. forensic <laughs> examination. That's, oh. The main theme is IFOX is inter it stands for interactive for forensic examination. You know, Cedar Fox was developed as a pure automation tool. All right? So it's, it's out there. It will tell you a yes or no and gives you some numbers with it and so on. I'm now saying we need to have a newer system where the features are not automatically computed. Cedar Fox does automatic computation, whereas IFOX is saying, please enter all the feature values that you have. I'm going to take it from there. And it will give you mostly statistical results out of it that you can use to saying, what is the problem? How rare is this thing? Uh, how this particular combination of TH. So that is the kind of results it will give you when you feed it. So it's an interactive system rather than an automated system. And that's available online as an online tool? Right now, I'm just doing research on this thing. We have, we have, uh, I'm a machine learning researcher, so I'm publishing this stuff in the machine learning community, saying this is a nice data set to work with. How are you going to construct those probabilistic graphical models, which are pretty complicated things, that take into account the correlation between variables. That's the main thing it does for you. So we're just there. Uh, once we finish that, we want to make it into a machine learning tool. You feed the samples, it will learn all the, uh, all the statistics from it, and then you can use it. So this is down the road and uh, not available at this point. <laughs> Let's thank our speaker.